sure how long this presentation goes. It's the first time I've given it. <laughs> so it could take 45 minutes if no one asks any questions, or it could take four and a half hours to see how it's <laughs> Or it could take forever. This slide is Um, the talk kind of split in two parts. Um, part one is just kind of a high level overview of search at sea. And then the second side um, is pretty much a deep dive into the kind of core data structure we use in the search engine. So we might have time for questions at the end. Feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions along we get, as we go. We'll see how it sort of plays out. Oh, okay, next one. All right, so um, yeah, as we mentioned in the intro, my name is Mark Pritchard. I'm the Director of Search and Technology at SEEK, uh, in the AIPS team at SEEK. Um, it's disturbing that I've had about 25 years in IT, that makes me feel older than I uh, actually am. But, uh, most of it's been in search and computational advertising, and high performance computing. Um, I've worked for some companies you might have heard of, but I've probably worked for a bunch of companies you haven't heard of. Uh, I've done a couple of startups, that's been fun. Uh, I was mentioning before the, the talk started, I think everyone should do a startup. It's super cool, really interesting. Uh, you'll learn a lot. I've had a, a wide variety of roles, mostly engineering, um, pure R&D, and I've even done some nice suits and, and done pre-sales as well. So I've had sort of a fairly wide range of experience. Uh, so that's me, a little bit about sort of AIPS at Seek. So Seek, I, I'm sure everyone knows who Seek is, like Seek AU, Seek AMZ, it's the lady in the robo and the pink smoke following around people. But the Seek group is actually a lot bigger than just Seek AU and NZ. So we actually have brands in Southeast Asia, in Hong Kong, Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia. Um, we are I'm part of a, a large Chinese a job search company called Xiaopin. Um, we've got presence in Mexico, so we're, you know, we're pretty sort of spread out through, through Latin America and Southeast Asia. And Seek has also acquired a bunch of companies and has a, a group uh, an arm that does early stage ventures, so ESVs. And we've got a few people from Jora tonight. They're one of our ESVs and our dear valued customers. And what's been interesting about the kind of evolution of AIPS and why the group was formed was we realized as we grew that we were basically reinventing and reproducing the same tech over and over again. So the idea behind AIPS was to kind of centralize this tech, centralize the function of AI and engineering and try and build these services once, build them well, deploy them globally, and operate them at scale across the group. So that's, that's what AIPS was born to be. So we have quite a few of my colleagues here from AIPS as well. Um, actually, I'll get people just to like, stick their hand up if you're from AIPS. Jeez, look at that, it's like half of you. <laughs> so if you see these people after the talk, have a chat to them, they're, they're really nice and friendly. Um, so we, we split into each of the different squads, runs different sort of sets of products, there's a litany of acronyms there for the different products that do different things. Uh, so we have like the Knowledge Graph team, KG, they deal with all of our data assets and ontology. Um, the Search, where I work, um, there's lots of different, different teams doing different things. And like I said, we build these services and operate them at scale. Part one of Search at Seek. So we're just going to dive straight in. So what does Search look like at Seek? Well, you probably see it on the left-hand side, if you've ever used Seek before. But you know, behind the scenes, we can get some pretty interesting queries. Right? Should we get a developer? Pretty obvious, software engineer, those kind of things. But of course, because we have presence in Southeast Asia, we get mixed languages. So we get C++, and Google tel Translate tells me that means developer or software engineer. I'm getting nods, that's good. Um, but so that's kind of interesting. So tokenizing Chinese is an interesting problem and has minted many PhDs. So that's an interesting <laughs> problem. But then the next one is accountant in Vietnamese. And if you've ever written a tokenizer, you think you know it's pretty simple, right? You just split on white space, and it doesn't work in Vietnamese. So Thoen, which is 
not pronounced either remotely correctly, that's a count. That's both of those tokens together is a count. So you can't just split on white space. So it gets kind of interesting. We have the standard diacritics like L'Oreal. Um, do we keep the apostrophe? Do we remove it? What do we do with that funky apostrophe over the E? Do we normalize it? Do we keep it? We have people searching for futures risk. So this is a, a role. And we, we don't want to turn that query into, you know, lemmatize futures and turn it into future. And then match a job that says this is a great, exciting role for someone interested in the, fu with the future in marketing or accounting or finance or something like that. Like futures risk is not future and risk or risky. Right. Um, chef and cook, people type that in. Um, if you're not a chef or a cook, they're actually two different roles. You don't serve chef jobs to people searching for cooks and you don't do it the other way around either. So chef slash cook as a query actually should be executed as chef or cook. But of course you can't just treat all slashes as ors because then you get v line 7 and all those kind of fun things. So I think it would be fair to say, is especially as you look at what probably many people in this room have, some, have done, developer not JavaScript the front end, developer minus JavaScript minus front end. I think our <laughs> queries can be summarized as inconsistent. Right? There's no kind of common and of course, my favourite one is if you're doing Boolean search, charity or not for profit. <laughs> <laughs> so, lots of fun. So, query parsing and processing is, is super interesting. Uh, okay, so we also have to support being a search engine. We have to support some pretty standard features that our partners want to use. So, we need to be able to filter by location, find me developer jobs in Melbourne, location is the filter there. Um, classification, if you drop down the, the box at the top, and we have kind of a structured taxonomy that we need to filter the jobs by salaries, date ranges, all those kind of sort of nice structured data, data fields or field that we need to sort and search for. Um, and then facets, you know, how many jobs are in ICT, how many jobs are in aviation service. We need to kind of build histograms of those kind of things on the fly as well. So all the standard stuff that you get out of Elastic Search as well. Cool. And then extensions. So if you've used Jora, you might have typed in a query, um, and then you'll notice on the results at the bottom, uh, Google does this as well, down the bottom is a bunch of related searches. Mm -hmm. So you type in develop, you get software engineer. Um, we return related searches for these queries as well. So there's AI models that, that build related search kind of graphs or data sets that we use to look up at search time. Um, canonicalization, so you type in dot net lowercase, and we rewrite that as dot n dot capital N et. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to generate links for Google to index and keep our, our page graph under control. So we canonicalize all the queries. We do things like entity recognition. So you type in uh, Bunnings as a query. We know that's a company. So we return, would you like to just search for Bunnings limited jobs? So entity detection and recognition. Uh, behavioral history, which I'll touch on in the next slide. And there's tons more stuff. So search is much bigger behind the, the scenes than just those boxes. Keep thinking that people who are taking photos are asking questions. But make sure you just raise your hand and ask a question if you have it. So behavioural history. So this was, I, I ran this demo on my phone just recently. Um, the majority of our traffic to Seek and Jora comes from mobile devices. And of course mobile devices have quite limited real estate. So as you can see, next, there we go. How do we make this kind of search more efficient? So barista jobs in Collingwood matches two and a half thousand odd jobs. It's a lot to scroll through on your phone. How can we make that process more efficient? Well, the way we do that is to track your history. So we collect your usage data, what have you viewed, what have you searched for, what have you clicked on, what have you applied to. We aggregate that by user and we make it available to the search engine. Right. And then in the result set, we can annotate the results with you last view this job a minute ago, or you applied to this job. So. This actually had some pretty impressive impact on our core metrics. I can't tell you what they are, but they were impressive. And we're all very happy. I think we've got donuts that day, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, the stats are uh, updated within about five seconds. So every with you in, interacting with, with the app or the website, um, that's available in the search engine in about five seconds. So typically, by the time you've clicked on the job details view and you've gone back, then so the results are there. Alright, cool. Thanks. 
So um, we do all of that and we do it kind of this fast. Um, so we do about 20 million requests a day. Uh, we hit about 600 requests a second at peak. Um, yeah, our, our median uh, latency is pretty decent. Um, screenshot probably can't read it there. Uh, that says three, so median latency is three milliseconds, which is motoring along. Um, 95th percentile is about 50, and um, I need to do some work on the 99th. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so the 99th percentile is kind of fun because people do searches for things like, um, what were we looking at today? Um, weekend jobs in Australia or something like that. So we have to find uh, all jobs in Australia, essentially, so that we can filter them and sort them and do related searches for them. And yeah, so these are all people doing queries across Australia. So I don't care where I work, I want to be an electrician somewhere in Australia. I'll fly in and fly out of the role, don't care where it is. So we need to do some work on, on that. But for the most part, we're pretty quick. Um, while we're doing all of this, we ingest about 30, it's between 30 and 300 updates a second. So that's job updates a second. So the index is changing 300 documents a time every second. Um, so you can see these, this is caught at the same, these screenshots are taken at the same snapshot in time. So you can see our traffic scaling up. And what I'm always checking in my morning coffee is how, how does my CPU utilization increase at the same, you know, is it going through the roof? And it's not, it's nice and flat. So we go from about 4% to about 13%. Our traffic climbs from about 50 requests a second to, in this case, over 400. So search engine is nice and efficient. Any questions? No? Yeah, you said you got, uh, it didn't look like the number of requests per second double the number of updates. So just what the updates to your base and then your price? Yeah, you think so? Yeah. So our partners. Uh, depending on, I don't know if you've used Jora versus Seek, but so Seek has a kind of fairly stable corpus, so the, the job updates get sent through each night just so that we can, for example, refresh our models. We might rescore jobs using a new version of an AI model. So they get refed every night. But then different partners like Jora, for example, they, they're an aggregator, so they crawl jobs. So they just constantly stream jobs to us. And it's a bit thirsty. Sometimes partners will like Seek might send us their re might be doing their nightly refeed while Jora is busily crawling at a big site. So, yeah. so it's between 30 and 300. Are they kind of cloning each other's data or? Sorry, are we? Are, are you guys sharing each other's data like Jora as well as Seek? Or is well, no, they're separate, separate brands. Separate, yeah. yeah, so separate companies. Okay. trade off or highlight sort of one of the reasons why we ended up building our own engine because we wanted to trade off kind of speed, speed's really important to us, but we also want our results to be as smart and intelligent as possible, they need to be as relevant as possible. So speed is a, a major ranking factor in Google these days. Um, I've got lots of links all the way through this deck, I might find a way to yep. share the yep. Prezo and you can click on the links and stuff, so don't worry about taking photos, we'll get the deck out. Mm -hmm. So speed's a major ranking factor these days. A lot of our traffic comes from SEM and SEO <coughs> campaigns that we run at Seek and Jora. Uh, we wanted fast, this is a mouthful, first content full paint, see paint. So if you're under a second, um, you get a nice speed boost, you get a nice ranking boost, that's all pretty good. But unfortunately, we don't have a second. So if you're on a 4G mobile, there's about 300 milliseconds just to turn on the radio, look up the DNS server, fire a request across the crappy 4G towers and bounce around to get to some fiber and then head off to a data center and you know, there's a bunch of work that goes on behind the scenes. So we, that's all in this 300 milliseconds. We can't do anything about that. That's just getting off your handset and onto the internet. And that sort of breaks it down then as a kind of a guideline that we have about 300 milliseconds to kind of handle the request and response overhead, sending HTTP requests, opening new connections, downloading logos and all those kind of fun things. Um, the server, this is kind of us, this is the search engine, go find me developer jobs in Melbourne. And then your handset or your device needs to render the results. Right? So we can kind of do some stuff here to make that a bit quicker, we can send you less HTML, we can compress it, we can make it more obvious, 
to the browser, how the page gets laid out and how it can render the page. But there's not heaps that we can do here. There's not heaps that we can do here. Um, it's all kind of layered up in, in sort of this suite of tech. Um, so we can use HTTP2 and do server push. We can turn on strict transport security so that we don't need to do the redirect between HTTP seek.com.au and HTTPS. We can tell your browser that you always just want to go to HTTPS, so we can we can save a redirect there, another round trip. Um, we can use the CDN that's distributed, we can inline images, all those kind of fun things. But unfortunately, um, our front-end team wants to use React, so um, <laughs> there's limitations. <laughs> Let's just say there's limitations. So really, we just have 200 milliseconds to work with in the search team, but Unfortunately, we don't even really have 200 milliseconds because you know, we like to deploy software, we upgrade our machines, our machines can glitch, we can have network <coughs> issues, but we always need to hit this 200 millisecond goal, right? So if we're going to retry, we really need to budget on half that, right? If we're going to end up retrying at some proportion of time, right? So we, we work to 100 milliseconds as our goal. <coughs> So now this side on the intelligence side of speed, so we sort of talked about how important speed is and we have about 100 milliseconds. On the intelligence side, we have a huge amount of data at Seek. We've, we've got about 20 years worth of job data. Uh, we have 12 million candidate profiles. So as, uh, this real-time data that I talked about for that behavioral tracking, we've got this real-time behavioral tracking system that looks at what people are doing on the site and feeds all of that back into a backend. So we've got all this data and of course we're, you know, it's 2019, so we're using AI and ML everywhere, so unfortunately that's as amazing as it is, not particularly quick. So we've got this integrated AI and ML layer, um, we're using the latest IR, which does all this kind of funky scoring when we're figuring out how to rank jobs, and all of this kind of has to run inside 100 milliseconds. Right? So we want to add more features to the engine as well, like it's not enough to just return the job results, we want to do more things as well. So, you know, is the job still available? Um, if you apply for this job, would, are you likely to be shortlisted? Um, you, one of the guys who was working on that project is, is standing over next to the bench. So, hello, Oliver. So, he's been working on that. Um, we'd love to be able to rank by travel time. You know, it, I live all the way out in Eltham. I'm probably pretty happy to, to travel along the Hurstbridge train line, but I don't want to go and jump on a couple of buses, especially in the winter time in, in Melbourne. So, you know, travel time, ranking by travel time would be really um, ranking by career path would be really interesting. If you're a, um, an assistant store manager, maybe we could give you a, a job as a store manager or a regional sales director or something like that. Right? There's heaps <coughs> of things that we can do. But the problem is they all cost time. Right? Everything costs time. We've got a 100 millisecond cap and we want to try and pack as much intelligence as we can into that 100 millisecond window. All right, so how do we solve that? Well, why did we build a bespoke search engine? So the first part is really flexibility. I could have also called that control. Right? We want to be able to own the entire request handling process. I don't want to disappear off into some third party library that I'll have to go and hopefully get the source code for and fix a performance issue. I want to own the whole thing. Right? If I don't own the whole thing, I can't hit my ass away. So this flexibility or this control lets us do some pretty cool things. So I mentioned on a previous slide that we have an AI and ML models that tag our jobs uh, with extra information that is suitable for retrieval. So since we control the engine, we can fire a thread off to go and look up jobs that match the, the ML model. And while that's working, we'll go and run some classic IR and try and set of jobs and then blend it back together again. Right? That's really easy. If you own the whole stack, that's just a future and, and you go and wait on it. That's pretty easy. Uh, we want to introduce a custom grammar. So the custom grammar makes sense of that that chaos of keywords that you saw. So people adding hyphens in the middle of words and at the start of words and pluses and was the plus just an accidentally escaped HTTP parameter, like a query parameter, or is it actually a space? I don't know. So the custom grammar kind of lets us adapt query execution based on what we think the query actually means. Right, so if we find bunnings in the query, we can go and execute a search for job that bunnings. Uh, and then we can also do sort of adaptive ranking as well. So uh, if, you're an, uh, if you're a masseuse in Ballarat, you're quite happy to travel all the way down to, um, say, Dalesford, you know, 45-minute drive, quite happy to do that. 
if you're a masseuse in Collingwood, you're probably only going to work around Collingwood, Richmond, South Yarra, somewhere around there. Anyway. So we can look at the kind of results that are coming back and change the way we rank the results based on the query and the, and the matches that we get. Right? It's, it's this kind of freedom of having complete control over how we match and how we rank. Yeah. Oh, and then there's like business rules. So the business rules might be things like, you know, we don't want um, we, we don't want to match just kind of the location you searched in. We might want to expand the area. How much do we want to expand the area? Well, that depends on how many results we get back, all those kind of things. So, you know, there's lots of, I'm speaking to a room full of developers, right? There's lots of business rules as well. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry? Compliance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jira, Jira, there are, AKA Jira tickets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then the biggest one, which is kind of what part two is all about, is performance. So we've got this 100 millisecond cap. We want to pack as much functionality into it as possible. How do we drag as much performance out of this engine as we can? So we can put requests up and execute them in parallel. We can break up search results and, and re-aggregate them. We can sort them in partitions. We can do all kinds of weird and wonderful things. We want to try and schedule as much work as possible, drive this machine as hard as possible so we can, we can hit our 100 millisecond SI. All right, so uh, we can cheat as well because we own everything. We own all the data. We own the search engine. Uh, we can cheat. We can pre-compute things. Like the, the quickest path of execution or the quickest way to make something run is to not do anything. Right? So we can move all that computation offline and pre-compute it. That's a great thing too. Right. Um, but of course, you know, it's, it's the internet. It's the modern internet. Everyone publishes stuff on GitHub. There's libraries for everything. We're on the JVM because the Java ecosystem is massive. Right? There's libraries yeah. everywhere. Right? So um, we're heavily using Kafka <coughs> and Cassandra. Um, we don't use Spring, we just use Jetty. So the core search engine is just a servlet. That's it. So it just sits behind the load balancer and serves requests. It doesn't need, any, need to be anything else. It's just a Jetty servlet. Um, but we also leverage a heap of libraries as well. So um, we use Antler for, process, for, doing our, for parsing our queries. Antlers also used for Twitter, for example, to process their search queries. So that was an amazing piece of kit. Uh, Chronicle, um, some of you might have come along to Peter Laurie's talk a, a few months ago. Um, we're heavy users of Chronicle. Um, ICU4j to do some linguistic stuff. There's you know, Lucene, we still use Lucene. We use the Vietnamese tokenizer from Lucene. It's there, you give it strings, it gives you back tokens, that's great. Uh, FastUtil, um, FastUtil's a library from these Crazy Italian people, um, primitive in, in maps and super quick stuff, really, really neat. Uh, Roaring bitmap, um, that's, there's a, a kind of fork of that in Lucene. It's used heavily in, I believe, Spark and a bunch of other kind of big data systems. Um, zero allocation hashing from the high frequency trading teams. So we don't want to do any allocation on our hot path. Right? That just crashes our garbage collector. We want to keep allocation as, as lean as possible. So we want to be able to hash things without any allocation. So we use a zero allocation hashing library. So all of these kind of things are just to drive as much performance out of this engine as we can. Um, and then of course, you know, the kind of standard infrastructure components in Lloyd for the gears for fun. Any questions so far? Quiet room. Who's the guy that asked the question? Ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Keep moving on. Oh, yeah. So the question is, uh, do we just use Jetty? And what else do we use? We just use Jetty. It's literally as simple as a handler. The handler gets a get request. We say, if the path is search, do a search. If the path is something else, do something else. It's literally just a big if statement. And it's really fast. So in, well, actually, in JDK8, it's now a case statement, because we can switch on script. So. Uh, this is a kind of high level overview of our ingestion. Um, so uh, I guess sort of quickly walking through the top left corner, um, our partner sends us jobs. Um, we use Amazon's Route 53 to do GeoDNS. Um, that bounces through a couple of load balances. And then we have this ingestion API. And the ingestion API is Jetty servlet. That's all it is. It takes the JSON, writes it to a Chronicle buffer. We do that because the, net, you know, the internet is the internet. So any of these nice solid lines can disappear. 
So we want to be able to receive our jobs, we want to keep them safe, and then when we can talk to Kafka, we can feed the jobs into Kafka. Yeah. So from there, we go this Kafka queue into some prioritization processes. So our different feeds have different priorities. So feeds from some of our partners have a different priority than others. So we prioritize them and then feed them back into Kafka, kind of getting the idea, right? Java process, Kafka, Java process, Kafka. Java process, machine learning stuff. And the machine learning stuff looks at the job and it tags the job with kind of extra metadata that we use in search. So this is all done, this is quite expensive, this takes time. So this is about the score of job with a set of keywords, takes about half our SLA in terms of, of latency, so it's about 50 milliseconds. So we can't do that at runtime, obviously. We can't do that at runtime for 2,000 jobs. Right, so it just gets done at ingestion time. And that gets sped off to the, the Kafka topic for indexing and then out to the indexer. And then we kind of have this loop around here because we also keep all of the jobs that we receive and their enrichments because then we can avoid doing this kind of ML pass up here if we've already got, if the job's just been updated, like someone's just said, this job is still live, then we don't need to re-enrich it all, right? It's just timestamp change. Right? So we get this kind of loop there. Yeah, make sense? The load balancers, are they AWS load balancers? Uh, there's no, I'm very proud of the fact that that is the only piece of AWS <laughs> that has that, that, is, that is probably not something I talk about in a big forum. But, um, we're not big AWS users in, our, in my team. Then why in my team? Seeker's a huge AWS customer. We love AWS. <laughs> but my team doesn't use AWS. Is that why you use Route 53? Because other parts of the company use AWS? No, no. Route 53 is actually a really good service. So Amazon, uh, Amazon has two really good services. It has Route 53 and S3. Everything else is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, so you would have seen back on that previous slide that we had the 50, 50 millis, uh, 50th percentile latency is three milliseconds. So we used to be on AWS, and we would deploy exactly the same binary on multiple machines at AWS, and we would find our latency would vary by 150 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So exactly the same binary, just redeployed onto another stack, and it's 150 milliseconds slower. Terminate all the instances, deploy it again, we're 150 milliseconds faster. Great. So we hit our SLA plus or minus not hitting our SLA. Do you have the scaling issues? No, we own, we're all on bare metal, we own, own the hardware. So we, our traffic is really, really consistent so we just scale it out. We have more, more hardware than we need, and it just runs. Yeah. So you might get the idea that simplicity is key, and that's, we really focus on just keeping things simple. Yeah. All right, so for search, it um, looks even simpler. So again, Route 53, uh, floating IP for, for redundancy, uh, and then we hit a search node. So that's it, All right, simple. So there's the indexer down here. It's busily feeding job, it's busily feeding job updates. So it feeds sort of mutations or deltas to the index into Kafka. And then each of the search engines subscribe to Kafka and take their updates. So is, there, is everyone familiar? Who's familiar with Kafka? Only a couple of people. Okay, so Kafka's, who's familiar with Kinesis? Even less people, that's good. All right, so Kafka is kind of like a, a kind of guaranteed stream of messages. You put a message in here, and then consumers can read it out of the stream and you're guaranteed to read the messages in the same order that the producer wrote them in. Right. So what that means is that our indexer can produce changes. So let's say I upload a job, um, it's job number 1000. The indexer processes job number 1000 and issues a mutation for job 1000. That gets written into Kafka. And then as the search engines can, as fast as they can, they listen to Kafka and, and pull those mutations out. So essentially once when everyone's got to the same mutation version, their indexes are all the same. And that's how we replicate the search. Yep. Uh, so deployment deployment is completely stateless. Each machine has an entire copy of the index. So it can serve a request from anywhere, right, or any partner site uh, anywhere in the world. And we distribute these across multiple data centers. And this is really, su this is really useful because scaling is, is as simple as buying more hardware. So, but we, don't, we tend not to have to scale up or down. Like I said, our traffic's pretty consistent, so we just have a fixed set of machines and they just do their thing. 
Um, and it's really easy to shift traffic between DCs as well. So if, the, if we're doing DC maintenance, we just take it out of the load balancer pool and route the traffic somewhere else. So really simple to maintain, really easy. So we spend basically no time managing our infrastructure. It's just there and it works and we don't touch it. So. Uh, it's quite scalable. So the solutions, you know, scalability has a few different meanings. I'm gonna, gonna hit most of those meanings. So scaling in terms of data or market footprint is really straightforward. To add another partner to search, it's, it's really simple. We give them an API key. Now if they feed us their jobs, then they can query the jobs again. It's really simple. You don't actually have to do much work at all. Really just generate an API key. Um, the features, now that we've kind of built the core engine, new features are really easy to build as well. So the first time we did an autocomplete, we needed to build a finite state automator that would autocomplete keywords as you type them in. Now that's there. Now building another finite state automator powered feature, it's really easy. Right, it's just there, you can just use it. So um, shipping a new feature like autocomplete for keywords is like two days work. And it's, it's just Java, right? So you write a unit test and it's in IntelliJ and it's really easy. Right, so it kind of democratizes this whole kind of high performance search. Right, pretty much anyone can do it. Um, and then of course, because it's kind of just Java, um, we get to use the components elsewhere. The Java ecosystem is huge. So we can take the Java components that we have, like the linguistic system that can parse C++ and then develop it in Chinese. We can take that and pop it in Presto as a user-defined function. And then our AI and ML team can use Presto and tokenize queries using the same tech that we have in search. Right, because it's just Java. So it's really easy to use. All right. So you say if you want to scale, you just add more hardware. Mm -hmm. So what if like, you have an expired speed in the house then? We just over provision. So at the moment, we're running at about 13% CPU utilization. So we could take seven times the traffic that we currently have, so 4,000 queries a second, and we'd still be at 80-90% you know, CPU. So, and there's no way we'll get to 4,000 like that would be. <laughs> Someone's DOSing us, <laughs> and our WAF has failed. So, yeah, that's just, yeah, we're massively over provision. But it's, it's just bare metal, so it's really cheap. Do you have uh, each Oh, uh, that's part two. <laughs> can, we, can I hold that question? Because yeah. part two is like 45 minutes just on your question. <laughs> 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 All right, cool. Um, so the project, I think, um, has been really successful. Um, we've de delivered sort of double-digit increases in our core metrics. Um, I'm being deliberately vague and fuzzy. Um, I can't tell you exactly what they are and what we measure, but it's been awesome. Um, so we've reduced things like bounce from from SEO, so people clicking through to links on Seek and Jora, um, and then going, oh, that result's terrible, and clicking away, that's a bounce. So we've reduced our bounce, we've increased engagement, and we've kind of unlocked this massive feature roadmap. So the project has been really successful. Mark, if you go back to the previous slide. Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can build amazing search engines, I don't know about driving PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, have to rebuild the stations until it's up to date again. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. So that's a really good question. Yeah. So the search engines will snapshot themselves. So we don't want to replay all of history. So the search search engines regularly snapshot, and then when they restart, they boot the snapshot, and the snapshot has uh, in Kafka uh, every message that you write gets an offset. Right. It's just a, a monotonically incrementing number. Right. So the snapshot is written as of an offset. So when a machine boots, it loads its latest snapshot. The snapshot has the last offset in Kafka that it had. It connects to Kafka. It hasn't started listening for requests at this point. It connects to Kafka. It rapidly runs through the mutation history, catches up again, opens its HTTP port, Envoy notices that it's now live and puts it into the pool. So we don't need to do anything fancy to do deployments. We just run an Ansible script. It drops machines, it boots them, does Part two. Sharding. Part two. Part two. Part two. No sharding. Sharding is evil. Um, <laughs> part two. <laughs> part two. Oh, part two. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry. You got what you wish Yeah, got what we wish for. All right. So, part two. All right. So, a little bit of the context. 
So our budget, as we said, is 100 milliseconds. But there's heaps of stuff to do in that 100 milliseconds. We're going to parse the query. We're going to figure out you know, who this user is. Do we have any past search behavior for them? Have they clicked on ads? Have they applied for stuff? Um, we need to hopefully go and find some jobs that match the query. We need to sort them and score them and rank them and do all kinds of stuff. We've got a lot to do. Um, and a lot of this logic needs each, each matched job. So on that query for barista in Collingwood, we got 2,600 results. A lot of this functionality, like finding out, um, like scoring and ranking, that actually needs all of the job data. So we need 2,600 jobs to run that query. Right? We need to pull that data in, right, in order to score it and rank it. So we want the results to be as smart as possible, but the latency still has to hit that 100 milliseconds cap. So if you sort of think about this and kind of decompose the problem, that actually means that our bottleneck is actually just retrieving job data. If you sort of think about it, like if we've got a big query and we need all of the job data in order to calculate its score, we actually need to fetch all of the jobs. Yeah. So just fetching the jobs actually takes a fair bit of time. So there's a work example here. Next one. All right, so I just did a search for developer jobs in Melbourne on Jura. I got 27,828 results. So at one microsecond, not millisecond, one microsecond, just pulling the job details for that will take 28 milliseconds which is a decent chunk of our latency. We haven't even started scoring or ranking or anything like that yet. We're just fetching the job details. So we can't really even read the data off an NVMe drive because an NVMe drive is 25 microseconds. So at 25 microseconds, it'll take us about 700 milliseconds just to retrieve the details of the jobs. Right, so we're like seven times slower than LSFA already. We haven't done any work yet just to retrieve the jobs. So job fetching actually needs to be sub microseconds. So this is kind of giving you a bit of context. Ah, is, that, is that you or me? Is that you? Cool. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so I'm pretty old. Uh, my first job was uh, working in assembly language on OBAX, tape drives, things like that. And the runtime of the programs that I used to write on that thick OBAX was dominated by something called a page fault time, right, the number of page faults. And page faults for seasoned campaigners like myself, a page fault is something where you want to get to a piece of memory. It's not actually in physical memory. It might be on a tape or a disk or a DASD, direct attached storage drive. And the machine needs to go and pull that code or data up off that disk, put it in memory, and then we can start doing some work with it. That's a page fault. And page faults are orders of magnitude longer than executing an instruction. Right. So modern hardware, it's actually not really any different. There's a great talk by a guy called Cliff Click, and the quotable quote that I love is, the main goal of any CPU, of any CPU is to get to the next cache miss. Because fetching something from data, or fetching something from memory is so slow compared to execution, execution's actually kind of irrelevant. Mm. I'll let that just kind of, that blow your mind? <laughs> like the whole idea of a CPU is not to actually execute anything, it's just to work out when it can issue the next load. <laughs> mind blowing. <laughs> so this table, uh, table of latency numbers every programmer should know. So one CPU cycle, <laughs> 0.4 nanoseconds, main memory access, 100 nanoseconds. I get about 200 instructions executed in the time it takes to fetch a piece of data from memory. Right, theoretical peak. Yeah. Uh, so we can take advantage of this imbalance, and we do. So computation for us in search, if it's going to take 28 milliseconds to get those jobs, computation is actually kind of free. Like we don't really have to worry about it as long as we fit inside that pre that fetch time. We can basically do whatever we want. So our latency is actually dominated by slow I/O time, where I/O is reading stuff from memory. So we can trade I.O. for computation. If we can avoid memory accesses by doing more work, that's actually a overall quicker request. Yeah. So a worked example, um, Word to Vec, everyone loves Word to Vec, embeddings, woo, change the world. So our source file for embeddings is a term, like a developer, and it has a vector, a floating point vector. That vector is about 100 floating point numbers. Um, we have almost 200,000 entries, so that file, that model, is about 75 meg. And 
it's really hard to compress. It's hard to squash that and do anything kind of compressed. You know, I can't just gzip it or something like that. If I gzip the whole file, I only get 6% improvement because it's essentially kind of random binary data. Yeah. But if we think about how we can trade computation for I.O., then we can do things like convert the floats to ints because we don't actually need more than six decimal digits of precision. So if we just treat them all as ints and multiply it by a million, now we have nice integer math. We haven't lost any precision, but now we get to use integer math. And as good as modern processors are, integer math is still about 10, between 10 and 40% faster than floating point math. So it's really nice to be in the integer world. Now we can zigzag in code. So instead of having large negative numbers and then large positive numbers and trying to do sort of delta encoding, we can use zigzag encoding instead. So negative numbers become odd, positive numbers become even, and you kind of interleave them. Right. So you, you don't end up having these big transitions between large negative numbers and large positive numbers, which kills your compression. Uh, and then we can just go and do things like simple delta compression and compressed integers. So all of that results in being able to take a 100 element vector and squash it to about, on average, 63.7 elements instead of 100. And you might think, yeah, that's kind of cool, like pretty good compression rate, about 36%. What it actually means is instead of seven cache line fields, so instead of seven reads from memory, so actually, sorry, quick pause. Does anyone know what, it, who knows what a cache line is? No one, cool, okay. So when you read memory from, uh, when you read a byte from memory, you don't bother reading one byte, you read 64. Because right? you have to send the address down to the memory controller and that has to put it on the bus and that heads off to the bus and figures out which DRAM chip that address is. The DRAM chip warms up and get the idea, it takes ages. So while you're there, you may as well pull 64 bytes instead of one. Right, so that's a cache line. Right? So if you're gonna to go to memory and get 64 bytes, then that fills a cache line, and we need seven cache line fills to get 63.7 vectors. Right? And sorry, 100 vectors. But with compression, we only need four. So we just saved ourselves three memory accesses. And as we remember from the previous slide, oh, this one, no, oh wait. Anyway, saving three times 100 nanoseconds is a really good thing. Yeah, right. so that's it. All right, so interestingly, doing all of this work, you generally use word to vec in a kind of dot product and cosine similarity. So the dot product, even with all of this work, is actually three times faster than just doing it with floating point numbers. So it was all worth it in the end. <laughs> So we just traded computation for memory access. We saved ourselves 300 nanoseconds, and we did all of this work instead. Yeah. And we grew three times faster. That's kind of cool. All right, so uh, school and context, we'll get to the cool bit in a sec. Um, our machines are all 64 gig machines. Um, the JVM needs 12 gig. Um, we have to have a chat to our AI people about getting rid of some of that data, and getting it offline. Um, the OS and some various services and things need a couple of gig. Um, so we've got about 50 gigs of physical memory left over. And to the question before, our index is 60 gig, because we don't do sharding. Every machine has an entire copy of the index. So 60 gig doesn't fit into 50 gig. But our, interestingly, our working set for any given data center, we have many data centers. So each of those data centers has a different query profile. right? So not surprisingly, the data center in Sydney serves queries for Seek, AU, and NZ. The one in Singapore does Southeast Asia. The one in the US does US stuff. So the working set's actually only about 8 to 10. So that fits nicely in memory. But we don't want to write code to have to deal with where am I, am I in Sydney, I'll load the index into memory. Like we don't want to have to deal with all of that. Luckily that's all done for us. Something called virtual memory, it's been around for forever. Um, great Wikipedia page, go and read it, it's, it's really good explanation. What it basically lets us do is say, I have this 60 gigs of data and I'd less like to pretend that it's all in memory. So I can jump around in that file and the operating system makes, makes sure that page is in memory when I need to get there. Remember what I said about that big old clunky mainframe and page faults? Exactly the same thing. Right? If I try to get to an address that isn't in physical memory, it issues a page fault, OS goes and pulls that page off disk, pops it in memory for me and returns control to my program. It's exactly the same. Um, now, there's, the only thing I don't like about Java is the memory mapping interface from file channels. So it has an integer offset, which is just a 
just insane because then you can only read too big because right, it's signed. I don't know what they were thinking because, you know, like no one would ever need more than two gig, right? <laughs> Um, so we don't use that one. Um, interestingly, there's uh, MAP0 and unmap 0 hiding away inside file channel impulse, so you can pull it out in the reflection and call it directly, and that has LOMs as parameters, so now we can seek around to 63 bits. It should be enough for everyone. So we get transparent paging. Um, the page sizes in the Linux kernel are about 4K. An NVMe drive is about 4K, so you get this really nice one-to-one -one mapping between an I.O. issued to the device and the memory page size. We just can pretend that the whole file is in memory all the time. And then another question I think that someone was going to ask is, um, so all of this stuff's sort of on disk. Um, you kind of don't want to just load up a search engine cold because everything's sitting on disk and now we have to go and hit the NVMe drive for all of the pages that we need and it's really, really slow. So we just pre-warm it. And so we skip through that 60 gig <coughs> file, 4K at a time, and just read a byte, the first byte of every 4K all the way through to 60 gig, and that will kind of warm enough stuff, and then we start listening to that HTTP port. Yeah, kind of force it into memory. Sort of like copying something that dev null, like it just reads it all off disk. Yeah. Um, and then of course we just let Linus marry, manage our memory for us. Like if we if that memory is in a hot, you know, hot, then it stays in physical memory. If it's not hot, it gets switched out. Okay. Oh, when you were Does the JIT link and try to do anything clever like ignore the, no, no. the read or no. no, it's not it's smart, but it's not that smart. Yeah. So um, we actually just hash all the first bytes so we don't just get that oh, call so alighted. Do something. Yeah, we do something with it, but it, yeah, the JIT's not smart enough to <laughs> work that around. Yeah. Good question. All right, next page. Alright, so a uh, quick recap and then we'll get on to the map. So we need a really fast way to get from any given key. It might be a job ID, it might be a location that we need to find the jobs for. We need a really fast way of getting from the key to the value, and it needs to be somewhere for a second. And this mapping has to be 01. Like we can't lock and go and repack something. We can't go, oh, you know, my thread pool or my connection pool is exhausted, I need to open another connection. Or We can't do any of that because we'll just blow our SLA. Right. So it has to be 01, and it has to be faster than the mic. So we can't use things like log structured merge trees. If you've seen Cassandra, that's the kind of SS table thing. You write it out to a big file. After time, you kind of compact it. You roll it up into the next biggest file. You do that iteratively, and you kind of keep it all nice and squashy. That's great. It doesn't work for us, because that packing time is time away from serving requests. Um, we can't do things like partitioning. We don't want to do B trees. B trees have this horrid random access pattern through the file, which we can't predict. And you know we can't do I/O anyway, right? It's too slow. So we can't do we can't do what this way. And we can't stall. But we have some things that can help. So we've got this massive imbalance between CPU speed and slow memory, and we can abuse virtual memory. Right? We can use it, use it for <coughs> virtual memory. Right. So press next too quickly. It's fine. What's a really quick way to get from a key to a value? <laughs> <laughs> I have <some>. hash <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what does our, our concurrent hash map look like? So these are kind of our specs. These are our requirements. We don't actually have many keys. We only have about 10 million keys. Uh, so that's one key for every job, that max. Um, we don't have a lot of keys. Reads massively dominate writes, even though we have up to 300 updates a second um, and we're doing 600 queries a second. For every query, we're matching thousands of jobs. Right? So our query rate is massive. It's hundreds of thousands of lookups a second. So our reads dominate writes. Reads have to be really fast. Right? Writes can be kind of slow. So reads have to be sub-microsecond. It's quite OK for writes to be kind of coalesced and batched and, and take three or four milliseconds. That's fine. No one cares about, you know, a job just got posted, and I hit search, and that job wasn't there. And then I ran the search three milliseconds later, and it was there. I'm going to contact customers. <laughs> <laughs> no one does, no one does. Right, no one does that. So reads have to be fast, writes can be slow. Reads cannot block ever. As soon as we block a read, then we blow our SLA. We can't block reads. Uh, writes can be serialized, so we don't need to have multiple writers. Multiple writers is a like, huge complication in concurrent anything. So we can just have a single writer. That makes our life really, really simple. Um, deletes are very infrequent. 
Um, and we need to support tens of gigs of data. So fairly straightforward. Yeah. Uh, so if you're super interested in this stuff, there's... Oh, sorry. That one. Okay. If you're super interested in this stuff, this is a great blog. This one here. So it's the fastest. It's not quite the fastest. There's some things that can go a bit faster, but it's pretty good. Right? It's, it's almost the fastest hash map. So that's really good. You should work through it. It's got great work examples. It, it's, it's really awesome. So everyone's probably done one of these in an interview question, but like, what's a hash map? <laughs> so there's the classic hash map where you have a bunch of buckets and then you collide. And what do you do on a collision? Well, you have a linked list. Um, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you will realize that these arrows are horrid. They're evil. They're an alarm. You missed your SLA. Every one of those arrows is a read to memory. Uh, we don't want any of those arrows. We want as, as, as few of them as possible. So the classic linked list is terrible because as you feed stuff into the buckets, there's no way the CPU can predict which bucket will collide and how long those linked lists are. And then, of course, the nodes get added and deleted, so they're just sprayed all over memory. So you have this beautiful random access pattern, which we can't do anything to optimize. Right? I read my 64 bytes from memory, and I'm pretty much guaranteed not to get the data I'm after. Because right? I'll get the, the thing I asked for, and then the next thing I want is somewhere else. I have to go back to memory. So pretty much every high performance map now uses open addressing. Uh, it computes the bucket directly. You basically just pad the number of buckets. You keep empty buckets. So you probe into a bucket and then you skip down. If that's not the key that you're looking for, you go to the next slot. Is that the key I was looking for? No, go to the next slot. If that's empty, then the key's not in the map. Right? Because if it was in the map, it'd have to be either where I probe for it or a linear stride. And the linear stride is really good because we know that the CPU will fetch 64 bytes. So even if it's not the first eight of those 64, it might be the next eight. Right? And it's already sitting in a cache, and it's nice and close to the CPU. Yeah. Right, so I'm not going to go through the... Well, I'm not going to go through the, the kind of little thing, but go and read the Wikipedia page, it's great. Uh, it talks all about collisions and all that kind of stuff. It's Um, so, that was backwards. Party check could help these things. Okay, so uh, for deletes, they're infrequent, so we just use a simple tombstone process. It doesn't cost us much to skip through a, a zero marker, right? it's just the next one. Remember, we, we just retrieved eight keys, right? so it doesn't matter if one of them is missing, we just go to the next one. There's almost no cost for that. That's a nanosecond. Fine. Um, but being able to use these kind of marker values means we don't need to keep a separate bitmap of, oh, this, this bucket was full, but now it's been deleted. So you know we don't have to go and execute another read to figure out whether that is a delete marker. It's just it's sort of sitting there. It's a special value in the key map. Yeah, so we save ourselves a lot of memory asset. Uh, for hashing, uh, lots of hash maps obsess about how good their hash function is. And it, yes, it, it is important, but again, we want to take advantage of this computation versus I.O. imbalance. So it doesn't really matter if our hash isn't very good and we collide a bit, because there's not much of a penalty for colliding. Right? We kind of remember that we read eight keys at a time, so it really doesn't matter if we miss one or collide one, because we can miss up to seven times and we still don't have any penalty. Yeah. Um, and then some kind of fun stuff, um, instructions. Uh, not, not all instructions are created equal. So integer division is faster than floating point division, but integer, integer division is still much slower than a simple bit mask. Right? If I have a 16 element table, instead of dividing my hash by 16 or modulus 16 to get my, my slot, if I just take the last four bits, it's the same. Right? So slot and last four bits, much, much faster than slot divided by 16. So up to 50%. Alright, so pop quiz, don't press next. Pop quiz. <laughs> Alright, so the answer is the next thing, so don't press, don't press next. <laughs> Alright, uh, so I've got a choice now. So I can interleave my keys. I can do. So, so you should be able to, if I've done my job, you should be able to answer this. 
So interleave keys. Do I interleave them? So key one, value one, key two, value two. Or do I have key one, two, three, four, value one, two, three, four is. Right. So give me some thinking music. <laughs> All right, so who thinks interleave is better? Oh, yeah, cool. What about contiguous? Mm -hmm. All about the same. Someone said just put their hand up twice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was kind of number three, so it depends. I should have had fourth, I don't know, please show me the answer. <laughs> All right, so it's kind of three, because like everything in IT is, it depends. Yeah. Can you do this? I don't know, it depends. All right, so caches are really fast, right? So if, if you're interleaving or it's contiguous and you fit inside cache, it doesn't really Right, it's inside cache. You pay 100 nanoseconds to get the memory, you pay a nanosecond to get the L1 cache. L1 cache is 32K per core on the machines that we use. So if your map fits inside 32K, it doesn't matter. Right? But it does matter if your, if your map doesn't fit inside those caches. Because every time I miss, so if I find the key, I probe and I find the key, hurrah, now I need to go and find the value. Oh, but the value is back in memory again. But if I interleave it, I've already got the value. What's my cost? Well, I trade prefetching four keys instead of eight for always missing or always avoiding a fetch of a value. Mm -hmm. And so I guarantee that I don't have to fetch a value if I find the key. Mm -hmm. And you know, memory's cheap, so we can just play with the load factor and kind of have more buckets and spread the map out a bit. And we don't actually pay any penalty. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the cache line's eight longs, so we get four pairs of piece of values. Um, we have a big load factor, like a, well, a small load factor, so we have lots of empty space, so that's really quick. Um, and you know, like I said, we get a free fetch for the value for every corresponding key. Okay. So, concurrency on the map. So we want to be able to write and we want to be able to read. Classic go-to solution for this is lock it, but you can't lock it. You can't lock it because Think about it, we're constantly trying to lock this map. We've got 600 requests a second running, all right? We're constantly locking the map. And a writer will want to stall the readers because it's the whole idea. Like I hold the write lock and I don't let readers read. But if you don't make that fair, the write will essentially never be granted the lock. Maybe at 1 a.m. when no one's using the site, but that, that doesn't do great things for our index fresh. Right? We want to keep the index not fresh. So if it's fair, it's actually much worse than what you think. If it's fair and the write lock says, I'd like to lock this map, then you stall all other readers that have arrived just after that write lock attempt at that acquisition. It hasn't got it yet. It's, it's, waiting. it's waiting for the concurrent reader that will already run into finish. Then it's going to grab the write lock. But that process, as soon as that write lock tries that acquire, you've now stalled. You've stalled all inbound requests because they're all waiting for the write lock to be granted and then released. Right, so it's, you'll see that as like, you know, latency, latency. And writes are really slow. Right? So not only are they slow in terms of um, the number of operations, they actually take a long time to propagate across the memory controller and be written into RAM right, versus a read, which is all cached and loads back. So writes are much, much slower than reads. So we can't, we, we just can't block. And then of course we might even repack it, like we might have filled the, the map to the point where we've got lots of garbage and we need to clean it all up and repack it, get rid of all our tombstones. So a write may actually trigger you know, three or four seconds of repack time. And we don't want to wait three or four seconds for our readers. Yeah. Right, so striping, maybe someone says striping, why don't you just have many locks and they can all be granted at the same time. So if you've heard of the birthday paradox, you only need about, I think it's 23 people to get a birthday collision. Right? So you can imagine I'm, I'm riding all over the map with lots of different keys, and I'm reading all over the map with lots of different keys. Guarantee that adding more locks doesn't help that. You're still going to collide. Right? You're still going to lock readers on write locks. It'll be less, but not much. Mm. Right? Especially with hundreds of thousands of reads at the same time, all over the map, and a bunch of writes at the same time. So it'll still contend, and we'll still block. Right, so we actually want to be wait free, not just lock free. Um, so there's a really good Wikipedia page about it if you want to read more about it. So how wait free can we be? Next one. Cool. All right, 
right, so let's just be really naive. Let's just say we're going to be lock free. So let's just write code without locks. <laughs> All right, so we've got some state. Um, this is one of our like entries in our map. We've got a key. We've got an offset to the value because the value is kind of variable size, so we need to keep that somewhere else. So we've got an offset to the value, and then we've got the value itself. Right? So starting state, everything's happy. There's no key. There's no value offset. There's no value. Everyone's fine. Readers are reading this. They land on this bucket. They get no key. Great. The key's not in the map. Everyone's happy. All right. So the first thing is the writer puts the key in there because we've got to write the key, the value offset, and then the value. So we write the key. All right. So um, it might surprise you, but writing a long to memory is not atomic. So you don't get either the value zero or the value of the long that you're writing. You might get something else. You might get the upper four bytes. You might get the lower four bytes. You might get something else entirely. Right? It's not. It's it's non-deterministic. Right? The value will change from the value that was there to the value that you wrote at some point. Right? So if you read that address at the same time, you are not guaranteed to get the original value or the new value, you will get something. <laughs> so it's not a thumb. So the key may be found, you might find a different key. You don't know. So what is atomic is a four byte byte. So an integer byte is atomic. A long is not atomic. All right, so that's kind of problem number one. It's a fairly big problem. Um, now I write the value offset. I have the same kind of issues. The value offset may be there. It may not be there. It may be something else. So I might end up reading a different job, or I might end up starting to try and figure out, you know, this word to vec vector for this job. Um, I start reading that in the middle of some other job's HTML, right? Because it's just a random offset. Right? It's chaos. So it's chaos. So we don't want to do this. So then now I have the value, but I wrote the value, but the value is big. The value is like three or four k, and I try and start reading it. Well, at some point I'll get the whole three or four k. At some point I'll get something else. Right? So. Without any locking, it's, it just doesn't work. Right. All right, so we think, what can we be really smart? Let's try it a different way. So complex client code, you can kind of work this around this, like, oh, maybe the key's not there, or it doesn't make sense, or I can hash it or check it. It's just a different way. So let's try and be smart. Let's do it any other way. All right, so we start from the same starting spot. Let's write it backwards. Let's see what happens if we write it backwards. So if we write it backwards, we write the value. That's fine, because our concurrent readers are busily reading and they get no key, and that's all fine. Right? The other thread's writing the value. That's great. So then we write the value offset. Still OK. The key's not there. So readers don't notice that we're busily doing this work in the background. But then, of course, we write mm -hmm. the key, and it's chaos again. Mm -hmm. right? We may get the right key. We may not. We may get the right value. We may not. We haven't done anything to manage the non-atomicity. Right? We just stuff things in memory in. We haven't done anything about making sure it's consistent. So again, same problem, complex client code, wrong answers. All right, so even if we could figure out some way of making all of that work, um, it doesn't work. No. <laughs> so CPU caches, they're generally our friends. Um, there's a thing called store buffer. So much the same way as you read a byte, you actually get 64 when you write to memory. Uh, you don't actually write to memory, you write to the store buffer, and then the store buffer gets flushed, so like a write back cache on disk. Right? So you write to the store buffer, and then the store buffer gets flushed. So both of these things, both of these, uh, these circuits in your chip causing all kinds of problems for your life will basically break anything that you do. Right? You either have to do volatile or locking or the other solution that I'll tell you about in the next slide. Right, so these data races are completely unavoidable. Right? So if I'm on um, this call and I issue a, re a request, that has to travel over a wire before it can get to some other piece of circuitry that says, oh, this chip's doing something that I'm also interested in doing. But th those data races are completely unavoidable. Right? It's just electrical signals propagating over wire. You can't do anything about that. Right? If they happen to start at the same time, there's no way that either of those cores know what the other one is doing. Right, so here's a bit of a work example. I should have done part two first while everyone was <laughs> awake and <laughs> caffeinated. All right, so we're going to run through this work example. So call one, it tries to read a key. And that key, it's, it's basically call one is going to write a key and a value into the map. Right? So the first thing it says is, 
is the key already in the map. And it, goes, it has a cache miss, and it needs to go and load value zero from memory, because remember, zero is absent key. So it gets the zero from memory and it pops it in its L1 and L2 and, L, and shared L3 cache. So that's great. Uh, we write the value because we're going to do our second, you know, that, that at least was closer to working, the second attempt. We're going to write them backwards. So we write the value, we write the value offset, and we write the key. At the same time we write this key, core 2 reads the key. So core 2, because of course like we can't control users running searches, right? We can't say, hang on a minute, um, I'm busily flushing some data to memory, can you not press search? Like we can't do that. So anything goes, like we can move this up or down and think about how it's all the weird and wonderful ways it breaks. So we try and read the key on core 2, and that's a local cache miss. But what's really interesting is CPUs are super smart. They won't go to memory. Core 2 won't go to memory. It pops a, a read request on the cache coherency bus and says, I'd like the value at this memory address. And Core 1 diligently answers and says, I have that. I just wrote it. Um, here's the value. So Core 2 says, thanks very much. I'll go and read V0. That's right. No worries. I can get it back from Core 1's cache. Fantastic. I've got a key and I've got a value offset. Now I'm going to go to memory and get the value which isn't there yet, because remember this is still writing it. Store buffers, takes a while to get to memory. Now I've got overlapping requests to memory, one for writing, one for reading. Who knows what I'm going to get? We probably will crash. No, we're not going to get what we think we're going to get, we're going to get something completely different. All right. So at some point in the future, our writes finish and everything's fine, but we are All right, so fences. Um, fences, I uh, heard Sutter spent two and a half hours on YouTube talking about fences. I'm not gonna do that today. Um, I really encourage you to read, to watch the, the videos. They're amazing. Um, watch them, watch them again. Take a day to digest it, watch them again. Um, it's, it's an amazing talk. It's, it's really incredible. Have coffee. Sorry? Have coffee. Yeah, yeah, have many coffees. It's phenomenal. Um, it's one of those videos that you watch and you have to pause, because you're just like, that was really deep. <laughs> it's like rewind and watch it again. Yeah. Really cool. Um, basically, if, if anyone's ever used sync on a file system or flush on a buffer, it's basically the same kind of thing. Right? So it flushes writes. Um, it makes sure that other writes are flushed before reads execute. And you get kind of explicit control over this. So let's do this again. Exactly the same process. We're going to have a core reading as a core writes to the same addresses, the same keys. But this time we'll use fences. So we read the key, the load, we issue a load fence because we want to make sure that we know that this address is consistent. So we'll issue a load fence. It's a cache miss, we fetch zero from memory, we store it in the caches. Then we write the value. We start writing the value because we're going to do it backwards, right? At, the fi at this point, we've got an extra read. Someone ran, mm -hmm. someone pressed search too early. So we're going to try and read the value of K. But that's fine because although it's a local cache miss, we get K0 from core one, that's fine. That's okay, this core just goes away and says that job doesn't exist. Then at this point, we issue a store fence because we want to make sure the value is completely committed to memory. Right, it's safe and it's in memory, that's great. Now we write the value offset. Again, we try and read K on a different core. Still, still okay, we haven't touched K yet, right, so it can just proceed. Then we store fence again. Flush that out, and then we write k. And then at the same time we read k. That's great. We get the value of k from core one's cache. We read the value of the value offset. We get that from core one's cache. Meanwhile, core one is still writing the value. It's doing some housekeeping. It's updating the amount of garbage we have in the map and the number of keys versus the empty slots, all those kind of things. And then eventually, core one finishes this put. But while it's been finishing that put, we've actually allowed a read to look at. Right? And that read is completely consistent. Yeah. Is that clear? Not really, clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> Send me the slides and I'll think about it later. <laughs> yeah. The short version is, using fences, we can control visibility. Right? We can control when we write things, and if we model this as kind of state, we just need to think, if someone was observing this process, this write process, mm -hmm. How can I manage the state of that process, that write process, so that it's always consistent? 
the value is either there or it's not. Is the store for it's doing some locking? No, completely, there's no locks. Okay. Like a known balance it's just a flush. So it just says to the controller, I want you to, before continuing, before doing any other work, I want you to flush all of this to memory. Yeah, there's no, no locks in this at all. Conceptually, is it fair to say that the fence uh, works similar to the synchronous locking mechanism that we use on memory? But this is no, just yeah. locked on the CPU, CPU fence? No, because there's no locks. No, it's really just controlling flushing. So there's no, there's no locks whatsoever. So it's basically just saying, I have finished with this write, and before doing anything else that can be, so there's, I guess a different way to answer your question is, I can observe what you're doing from a different core, much like multi-threading, if I just have an array and one, one core's writing into the array and the other one's reading from the array at the same time, and you don't do any locking at all, like this thread can observe what you're doing over here. Does that make sense? Exactly the same kind of thing happens with core one and core two. So core two can happily read what you're doing from your cache. Yeah, or you store properly. So you're explicitly controlling the flush as opposed to letting the CPU handle Correct. the store buffer. Yeah, right? exactly right. So it's like in C when you do a. a so C, flush. yes. So acquire and release. So C C eleven's atomic primitives acquire and release. It's exactly the same. So this was introduced in in JDK 8, the store and, and load fences. Exactly the same. So it's not volatile, it's not locked, it's not synchronized, it's just low level CPU instructions to say, this data should be flushed to memory before doing anything else. Yeah. So I can't even, if I didn't do these fences, core two can read the data straight out of your store buffer. Because you know cores are friendly and collaborative, right? Like, I don't want you to go to memory, I've got that value here. The fact that you can read that value out of order, oh well, you know, I saved you a trip to memory. <laughs> it doesn't help you. Right? So these sensors allow you to control visibility and make sure that the visibility semantics make sense to your app. Sorry, that question at the back and the middle. What did you do before Java 8? Uh, you couldn't do this. Uh, there was volatile, basically. Big, big blocks of volatile memory and you copied stuff between them and switched them in and out. So luckily JDK 8 was out before we started writing the search engine. Um, old, old engines that I used to build were much more horrid and not as fast. Uh, well, maybe following on from that question, but how do you control this in Java and even the memory layout of your hash map? Ah, so we don't use the heap. This is all off heap. I forgot to put that in the slide. This is all off heap. It's all in virtual memory. It's all mapped files. So there's no... There's no heap. The, J the JVM's not involved in this at all. So it's all unsafe. So unsafe gives you, you know, you can map a map a file and you get a pointer. And then if you want to read along, then you read eight bytes from that address and you treat it as a one. It's like old school C <laughs> stuff. So when it comes to <laughs> <in> Java. <laughs> <laughs> like interleaving the key and value, for yeah. example, you're just doing that the same yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, so like maybe I've got a, let's say I've got a right four keys and four values, and I've got them as a list of pairs of numbers or something like that, literally go through and go put eight bytes for the key, put eight bytes for the value, put eight bytes for the key, put eight bytes. Yep. Is the cache, uh, the search of load things, is that uh, the cache line, or is it just literally the, the it, eight It's bytes. the address. It's the actual address. It's the address. Uh, clear as mud, should we move on? <laughs> All right, next one. All right, so tricky question, I'm being kind of cruel, tricky question at the end of the night. So as you mentioned, this is the same process as we did before. Why don't we need, so we've got load fences here and here, like on the read of the key. Why don't we need a load fence for the value offset and the value? It's terribly mean. Sorry? Yeah, 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 it's already been stored. That was the whole idea of the store fences is that we made sure that our semantics of what was available <laughs> is consistent. So when we read, we know that it's, if we can get the key, we know that everything else is already there. Yeah. Okay. All right, but there's another, there's another reason. Um, so if we mutated things in place, then all bets are off, right? Like if I write 
over the top of an existing value in the mm -hmm. buffer, then like I can't atomically write eight bytes, I certainly can't write atomically write three K. Right? So if I might if I mutate values in place then it's all it's game over again. So our our map is append only. So new new buffer like new puts are always appended to the value buffer. So we have a key and a value offset buffer and a value buffer. We just append yep. Alright, I think we're all on track. So the, the flyaway concept, like you're saying, is kind of how do we actually control our memory layout? Well, we don't. Like we have a class um, that's called an indexed job, and that indexed job is created, and then it says, give me a view of an indexed job at this memory address. And then you know our templating system and our scoring system can say, I'd like the score field for this indexed job. Oh, now I'd like the ID, and oh, now I'd like the HTML. And that job, that indexed job class, takes the address and goes and adds, oh, this is the fourth field and the preceding three fields were all long, so I need to read it by 24. Offset from my player. Yeah. You essentially implement all the stuff behind a C struct, but you have to do it manually because Java doesn't have structs. All right, so no deserialization. We never deserialize. And the kind of cool, cool thing is these methods that read individual fields all become jittered and they, they're all basically free. Like they, all, they all just get compiled away and they're just pointer plus offset math. CPU is really good at that. So, yeah, we, that's what I was just sort of talking about here. We have a pointer to the current job and then the field accesses are just offset reads from, from that pointer. So, after all of this work, our gets are sub microseconds. Right? Most of the time, they're 200 nanoseconds. So 100 nanoseconds to get to the four keys and the four values. So we <coughs> take our key, we hash it, we take the modulus to the bit, like the preceding bit mask, that gives us a pointer offset, we do a read, it will miss probably. 100 nanoseconds to get four keys and values, a few nanoseconds to check the keys, make sure that we've got the, the right slot. Now we've got a value offset, we've probably missed the value offset, that's probably back in, in memory again. But everything that we need to score a job in terms of ranking is in the first 64 bytes of the value. Why is it in the first 64 bytes? Because we've already fetched it. Yep. By the time we read the first byte, we've already got the first 64 bytes. So we do lots of bit field packing and all kinds of stuff to try and cram as much information that we need into the first 64 bytes because then it's fresh. Yeah. All right, so... Uh, Obligatory warning. Um, if you can't take hold of JVM, well done. You can do it pretty regularly. Uh, we used to have a sign like uh, days since last seg fault. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, there's no there's no seatbelts here, like you're off heap if you mess up your pointer arithmetic, you crash, or you get something weird, or your customers say why and are you returning Swahili instead of English HTML? <laughs> yeah, it's that's pretty bad. Um, and of course because we want to do deployments, rolling deployments without taking things out of service, our load balance is configured to retry requests. So if a request crashes a machine and the load balancer retries the request, you crash another machine <laughs> and then you crash another machine <laughs> and you take a cluster out. So my boss is in the audience, luckily that hasn't happened. <laughs> we don't plan on it happening because we do lots of testing. Right. So that's pretty much it. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, Lots of questions if you want them. Questions? So if you go like deep down to other levels now, like CPU instruction, mm -hmm. and not using the JVM, so mm -hmm. is there any benefit of using Java instead of like CPU? So, so the big miss that Java doesn't have yet is something like CMD. So that, that's hugely powerful for web tech and other kind of computation. You can get to CMD by Java, but you have to hop mm -hmm. through an AD function call. And that penalty, is so severe, it's many, many, many nanoseconds. Um, we, we just don't do it as fast as we keep the computation in, in Java. Um, there, are, there, there are some initiatives about like fast function call interface and things in Java, but they're, it's still, you know, they're still measuring microseconds. So like, to do that per job, it's just too slow. Have you looked at method handles to replace your answer? Yeah.
the, the net scale out to we want to be kind of just map the whole thing. We want to take advantage of the that that would be really good. <coughs> if we could use them with large like multi tens of gigs of worth of data sitting on an NVMe drive. Yeah. Yeah, but that yeah, doesn't the method handles is awesome, like that's fantastic. But mm. yeah, not not for our use case unfortunately. Yeah, really good question. So um, we chose Java because Java's kind of like a Toyota Camry. Like it's quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> like it just it just you get in it, you drive to the shop, you get your shopping and you come home again. And it just works and it's well tuned and the libraries you know, you can buy buy a new indicator bulb for your Camry at seven eleven. Like it's just same kind of thing for Java. You can get libraries for everything. Like we don't you know, we we wanted to process um, do Thai tech segmentation. So you like Google Thai tech segmentation and you find the guy that got his PhD from the University of Thailand, he wrote a Thai segmenter, it's in Java, it won the University of Thailand's natural language processing competition, and it's kind of, it's just like live tech, just email a guy, can I use your tokenizer? So the Java ecosystem is amazing. It's one critical flaw is the fact that it's not C, right? So you can't, <laughs> <laughs> you can't do stuff like this. Yeah, so then you, then unfortunately you pay that native boundary cross, and it's not just the invocation of the native boundary call, is that the JVM has to be brought to a safe point when you jump into a native call, right? Because you need to basically have all of your memory store fenced and flushed and consistent, because who knows what that C code is going to do, right? It could do whatever it wants. And then when you come back again, back to a safe point, and then let everyone go. So safe, like safe point poles are huge, like, Again, you're into microseconds and milliseconds. So, yeah. good, really good question, though. Um, I, I wish Java had better support for doing this kind of stuff. It's not bad. You can kind of cobble it together and hide it away from from everyone else. And it's just a couple of classes that do some pretty hairy stuff. But everything else, you know, you just don't notice. So you don't. You can you can write code. You know, you can pass those index jobs, those little flyweight handles. We use handle handlebars for our templating engine. Handlebars gets instances of those index jobs, so like all of the funky offset pointer arithmetic, which just works fine, right? Because it's just a Java interface, it's got getters and setters. <laughs> you just don't want to, you don't want to look under the cover too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? The 100 millisecond SLA, mm -hmm. is that mainly because of the Google search? Yeah. Yep. Is there anything, any processing? It's it's mostly that, but that, that's really come from a bunch of user experience as well. So, you know, there's, um, I think Amazon did a study where they said for every, is every 200 milliseconds it cost them 40 million in revenue. Uh, there's tons of articles about it. So the slower your site is, the less engagement you have. So, so we want to be as fast as possible. And the Google metric is really just to proxy that in rankings. All right. Any other questions? That is the thank you slide. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to hang around and answer other yeah. questions if you've got them. So, yeah. But it's after 8 o'clock.